Allen Ginsberg, Erwin Allen Ginsberg, June 3, 1926, April 5, 1997, was an American poet, philosopher and writer. He is considered to be one of the leading figures of both the Beat Generation during the 1950s and the counterculture that soon followed. He vigorously opposed militarism, economic materialism and sexual repression and was known as embodying various aspects of this counterculture, such as his views on drugs, hostility to bureaucracy and openness to Eastern religions. He was one of many influential American writers of his time known as the Beat Generation, which included famous writers such as Jack Kerouac and Williams. Burroughs Ginsburg is best known for his poem Howl, in which he denounced what he saw as the destructive forces of capitalism and conformity in the United States. In 1956, Howl was seized by San Francisco police and U.S. Customs. In 1957, it attracted widespread publicity when it became the subject of an obscenity trial, as it described heterosexual and homosexual sex at a time when sodomy laws made homosexual acts a crime in every U.S. state. Howe reflected Ginsburg's own homosexuality and his relationships with a number of men, including Peter Orlovsky, his lifelong partner. Judge Clayton W. Horn ruled that Howe was not obscene, adding, Would there be any freedom of press or speech if one must reduce his vocabulary to vapid innocuous euphemisms? Ginsburg was a practicing Buddhist who studied Eastern religious disciplines extensively. He lived modestly, buying his clothing in second-hand stores and residing in downscale apartments in New York's East Village. One of his most influential teachers was the Tibetan Buddhist Chugam Trungpa, the founder of the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado. At Trungpa's urging, Ginsburg and poet Ann Waldman started the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics there in 1974. Ginsburg took part in decades of nonviolent political protest against everything from the Vietnam War to the war on drugs. His poem September on Jaysore Road, calling attention to the plight of Bangladeshi refugees, exemplifies what the literary critic Helen Bendler described as Ginsburg's tireless persistence in protesting against imperial politics and persecution of the powerless. His collection The Fall of America shared the annual U.S. National Book Award for Poetry in 1974. In 1979 he received the National Arts Club Gold Medal and was inducted into the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters. Ginsburg was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 1995 for his book Cosmopolitan Greetings Poems 1986-1992. Ginsburg was born into a Jewish family in Newark, New Jersey, and grew up in nearby Patterson. As a young teenager, Ginsburg began to write letters to the New York Times about political issues, such as World War II and workers' rights. While in high school, Ginsburg began reading Walt Whitman, inspired by his teacher's passionate reading. In 1943, Ginsburg graduated from Eastside High School and briefly attended Montclair State College before entering Columbia University on a scholarship from the Young Men's Hebrew Association of Patterson. In 1945, he joined the Merchant Marine to earn money to continue his education at Columbia. While at Columbia, Ginsburg contributed to the Columbia Review Literary Journal, the Jester Humor Magazine, won the Woodbury Poetry Prize, served as president of the Philalexian Society, Literary and Debate Group, and joined Bohr's Head Society, Poetry Society. Ginsburg has stated that he considered his required freshman seminar in Great Books, taught by Lionel Trilling, to be his favorite Columbia course. According to the Poetry Foundation, Ginsburg spent several months in a mental institution after he pleaded insanity during a hearing. He was allegedly being prosecuted for harboring stolen goods in his dorm room. It was noted that the stolen property was not his, but belonged to an acquaintance. Ginsburg referred to his parents, in a 1985 interview, as old fashioned delicatessen philosophers. His father, Louis Ginsburg, was a published poet and a high school teacher. Ginsburg's mother, Naomi Livergant Ginsburg, was affected by a psychological illness that was never properly diagnosed. She was also an active member of the Communist Party and took Ginsburg and his brother Eugene to party meetings. Ginsburg later said that his mother made up bedtime stories that all went something like, the good king rode forth from his castle, saw the suffering workers and healed them. Of his father Ginsburg said my father would go around the house either reciting Emily Dickinson and Longfellow under his breath or attacking. S. Eliot for ruining poetry with his obscurantism. I grew suspicious of both sides. Naomi Ginsburg's mental illness often manifested as paranoid delusions. She would claim, for example, that the president had implanted listening devices in their home and that her mother-in-law was trying to kill her. 
Her suspicion of those around her caused Naomi to draw closer to young Alan, her little pet, as Bill Morgan says in his biography of Ginsburg, titled, I Celebrate Myself, The Somewhat Private Life of Alan Ginsburg. She also tried to kill herself by slitting her wrists and was soon taken to Greystone, a mental hospital, she would spend much of Ginsburg's youth in mental hospitals. His experiences with his mother and her mental illness were a major inspiration for his two major works, Howell and his long autobiographical poem Cottage for Naomi Ginsburg, 1894-1956. When he was in junior high school, he accompanied his mother by bus to her therapist. The trip deeply disturbed Ginsburg, he mentioned it and other moments from his childhood in Cottage. His experiences with his mother's mental illness and her institutionalization are also frequently referred to in Howell. For example, Pilgrim State, Rockland, and Greystone's Fetid Halls is a reference to institutions frequented by his mother and Carl Solomon, ostensibly the subject of the poem, Pilgrim State Hospital and Rockland State Hospital in New York and Greystone Park Psychiatric Hospital in New Jersey. This is followed soon by the line with mother finally. Ginsburg later admitted the deletion was the expletive fucked. He also says of Solomon in Section 3, I'm with you in Rockland where you imitate the shade of my mother once again showing the association between Solomon and his mother. Ginsburg received a letter from his mother after her death responding to a copy of how he had sent her. It admonished Ginsburg to be good and stay away from drugs, she says, the key is in the window, the key is in the sunlight at the window, I have the key, get married Alan don't take drugs, the key is in the bars, in the sunlight in the window. In a letter she wrote to Ginsburg's brother Eugene, she said, God's informers come to my bed and God himself I saw in the sky. The sunshine showed too, a key on the side of the window for me to get out. The yellow of the sunshine, also showed the key on the side of the window. These letters and the absence of a facility to recite Kaddish inspired Ginsburg to write Kaddish which makes references to many details from Naomi's life, Ginsburg's experiences with her, and the letter, including the lines the key is in the light and the key is in the window. In Ginsburg's freshman year at Columbia he met fellow undergraduate Lucy and Carr who introduced him to a number of future beat writers, including Jack Kerouac, William S. Burroughs, and John Clell and Holmes. They bonded, because they saw in one another an excitement about the potential of American youth, a potential that existed outside the strict conformist confines of post-World War II, McCarthy-era America. Ginsburg and Carr talked excitedly about a new vision, a phrase adapted from Yeats' a vision, for literature in America. Carr also introduced Ginsburg to Neil Cassidy, for whom Ginsburg had a long infatuation. In the first chapter of his 1957 novel On the Road Kerouac described the meeting between Ginsburg and Cassidy. Kerouac saw them as the dark, Ginsburg, and light, Cassidy, side of their new vision, a perception stemming partly from Ginsburg's association with communism, of which Kerouac had become increasingly distrustful. Though Ginsburg was never a member of the Communist Party, Kerouac named him Karl Marx in On the Road. This was a source of strain in their relationship. Also, in New York, Ginsburg met Gregory Corso in the Pony Stable Bar. Corso, recently released from prison, was supported by the Pony Stable patrons and was writing poetry there the night of their meeting. Ginsburg claims he was immediately attracted to Corso, who was straight, but understanding of homosexuality after three years in prison. Ginsburg was even more struck by reading Corso's poems, realizing Corso was spiritually gifted. Ginsburg introduced Corso to the rest of his inner circle. In their first meeting at the Pony Stable, Corso showed Ginsburg a poem about a woman who livened across the street from him and sunbathed naked in the window. Amazingly, the woman happened to be Ginsburg's girlfriend that he was living with during gone of his forays into heterosexuality. Ginsburg took Corso over to their apartment. There the woman proposed sex with Corso, who was still very young and filled in fear. Ginsburg introduced Corso to Kerouac and Burroughs and they began to travel together. Ginsburg and Corso remained lifelong friends and collaborators. Shortly after this period in Ginsburg's life, he became romantically involved with Elise Nada Cohen after meeting her through Alex Greer, a philosophy professor at Barnard College whom she had dated for a while during the burgeoning Beat Generation's period of development. As a Barnard student, Elise Cohen extensively read the poetry of Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot. When she met Joyce Johnson and Leo Skier, among other beat players, Donna's Cohen had felt a strong attraction to darker poetry most of the time. Beat poetry seemed to provide an allure to what suggests a shadowy side of her persona. While at Barnard, 
Cohen earned the nickname Beat Alice as she had joined a small group of anti-establishment artists and visionaries known to outsiders as Beatniks, and one of her first acquaintances at the college was the beat poet Joyce Johnson who later portrayed Cohen in her books, including minor characters in Come and Join the Dance, which expressed the two women's experiences in the Barnard and Columbia Beat community. Through his association with Elise Cohen, Ginsburg discovered that they shared a mutual friend, Carl Solomon to whom he later dedicated his most famous poem Howl. This poem is considered an autobiography of Ginsburg up to 1955, and a brief history of the beat generation through its references to his relationship to other beat artists of that time. In 1948 in an apartment in Harlem, Ginsburg had an auditory hallucination while reading the poetry of William Blake, later referred to as his Blake vision. At first, Ginsburg claimed to have heard the voice of God but later interpreted the voice as that of Blake himself reading a Sunflower, The Sick Rose, and Little Girl Lost, also described by Ginsburg as voice of the Ancient of Days. The experience lasted several days. Ginsburg believed that he had witnessed the interconnectedness of the universe. He looked at Lattice work on the fire escape and realized some hand had crafted that, he then looked at the sky and intuited that some hand had crafted that also, or rather, that the sky was the hand that crafted itself. He explained that this hallucination was not inspired by drug use, but said he sought to recapture that feeling later with various drugs. Ginsburg stated, Living blue hand itself. Or that God was in front of my eyes, existence itself was God, and in it was a sudden awakening into a totally deeper real universe than I'd been existing in. Ginsburg moved to San Francisco during the 1950s. Before Howl and Other Poems was published in 1956 by City Lights Bookshop, he worked as a market researcher. In 1954, in San Francisco, Ginsburg met Peter Orlovsky, 1933-2010, with whom he fell in love and who remained his lifelong partner. Selections from their correspondence have been published. Also in San Francisco, Ginsburg met members of the San Francisco Renaissance, James Broughton, Robert Duncan, Madeline Gleason and Kenneth Rexroth and other poets who would later be associated with the Beat Generation in a broader sense. Ginsburg's mentor William Carlos Williams wrote an introductory letter to San Francisco Renaissance figurehead Kenneth Rexroth, who then introduced Ginsburg into the San Francisco poetry scene. There, Ginsburg also met three budding poets and Zen enthusiasts who had become friends at Reed College Gary Snyder, Philip Whalen, and Lou Welch. In 1959, along with poets John Kelly, Bob Kaufman, A. D. Winans, and William Regulus, Ginsburg was one of the founders of the Beatitude Poetry magazine. Wally Hedrick, a painter and co-founder of the Six Gallery, approached Ginsburg in mid-1955 and asked him to organize a poetry reading at the Six Gallery. At first, Ginsburg refused, but once he had written a rough draft of Howl, he changed his fucking mind, as he put it. Ginsburg advertised the event as six poets at the Six Gallery. One of the most important events in Beat Mythos known simply as the Six Gallery Reading took place on October 7, 1955. The event, in essence, brought together the East and West Coast factions of the Beat Generation. Of more personal significance to Ginsburg, the reading that night included the first public presentation of Howl, a poem that brought worldwide fame to Ginsburg and to many of the poets associated with him. An account of that night can be found in Kerouac's novel The Dharma Bums, describing how change was collected from audience members to buy jugs of wine, and Ginsburg reading passionately, drunken, with arms outstretched. Ginsburg's principal work, Howl, is well known for its opening line, I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving hysterical naked, Howl was considered scandalous at the time of its publication, because of the rawness of its language. Shortly after its 1956 publication by San Francisco's City Lights bookstore, it was banned for obscenity. The ban became a cause celebre among defenders of the First Amendment, and was later lifted, after Judge Clayton W. Horn declared the poem to possess redeeming artistic value. Ginsburg and Sheik Murrell, the City Lights manager who was jailed for selling Howl, became lifelong friends. Ginsburg claimed at one point that all of his work was an extended biography, like Kerouac's Deluo's Legend. Howl is not only a biography of Ginsburg's experiences before 1955 but also a history of the Beat Generation. Ginsburg also later claimed that at the core of Howl were his unresolved emotions Abuthi's schizophrenic mother. Though Kaddish deals more explicitly with his mother, Howl in many ways is driven by the same emotions. Howl chronicles the development of many important friendships throughout Ginsburg's life.
He begins the poem with I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, which sets the stage for Ginsburg to describe Cassidy and Solomon, immortalizing them into American literature. This madness was the angry fix that society needed to function, madness was its disease. In the poem, Ginsburg focused on Carl Solomon. I'm with you in Rockland, and, thus, turned Solomon into an archetypal figure searching for freedom from his straitjacket. The references in most of his poetry reveal much about his biography, his relationship to other members of the Beat Generation, and his own political views. How, his most famous poem, is still perhaps the best place to start. In 1957, Ginsburg surprised the literary world by abandoning San Francisco. After a spell in Morocco, he and Peter Orlovsky joined Gregory Corso in Paris. Corso introduced them to a shabby lodging house above a bar at 9 Rue Git Liqueur that was to become known as the Beat Hotel. They were soon joined by Burroughs and others. It was a productive, creative time for all of them. There, Ginsburg began his epic poem Kaddish, Corso composed Bomb and Marriage, and Burroughs, with help from Ginsburg and Corso, put together naked lunch from previous writings. This period was documented by the photographer Harold Chapman who moved in at about the same time, and took pictures constantly of the residence off hotel until it closed in 1963. During 1962 to 1963, Ginsburg and Orlovsky traveled extensively across India, living half a year at a time in Calcutta, now Kolkata, and Benares, Varanasi. Also during this time, he formed friendships with some of the prominent young Bengali poets of the time including Shakti Chattopadhyay and Sunil Gankopadhyay. Ginsburg had several political connections in India, most notably Papul Jayakar who helped him extend his stay in India when the authorities were eager to expel him. In May 1965, Ginsburg arrived in London, and offered to read anywhere for free. Shortly after his arrival, he gave a reading at Better Books, which was described by Jeff Nuttall as the first healing wind on a very parched collective mind. Tom McGrath wrote, this could well turn out to have been a very significant moment in the history of England, or at least in the history of English poetry. Soon after the bookshop reading, plans were hatched for the International Poetry Incarnation, which was held at the Royal Albert Hall in London on June 11, 1965. The event attracted an audience of 7,000, who heard readings and live and tape performances by a wide variety of figures, including Ginsburg, Adrian Mitchell, Alexander Trochi. Harry Fainlight, Anselm Hollow, Christopher Logue, George Macbeth, Gregory Corso, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Michael Horowitz, Simon Vincanogue, Spike Hawkins and Tom McGrath. The event was organized by Ginsburg's friend, the filmmaker Barbara Rubin. Peter White had documented the event on film and released it as Holy Communion. A book featuring images from the film and some of the poems that were a performed was also published under the same title by Lorimer in the UK and Grove Press in US. Though the term beat is most accurately applied to Ginsburg and his closest friends, Corso, Orlovsky, Kerouac, Burroughs, etc., the term beat generation has become associated with many of the other poets Ginsburg met and became friends with in the late 1950s and early 1960s. A key feature of this term seems to be a friendship with Ginsburg. Friendship with Kerouac or Burroughs might also apply, but both writers later strove to disassociate themselves from the name beat generation. Part of their dissatisfaction with the term came from the mistaken identification of Ginsburg as the leader. Ginsburg never claimed to be the leader of a movement. He claimed that many of the writers with whom he had become friends in this period shared many of the same intentions and themes. Some of these friends include David Amram, Bob Kaufman, Diane D. Prima, Jim Cohn, poets associated with the Black Mountain College such as Robert Greeley and Denise Levertov. Poets associated with the New York school such as Frank O'Hara and Kenneth Koch. Roi Jones before he became Amiri Baraka, who, after reading Howell, wrote a letter to Ginsburg on a sheet of toilet paper. Through a party organized by Amiri Baraka, Ginsburg was introduced to Langston Hughes while Ornette Coleman played saxophone. Later in his life, Ginsburg formed a bridge between the beat movement of the 1950s and the hippies of the 1960s, befriending, among others, Timothy Leary, Ken Kesey, and Bob Dylan. Ginsburg gave his last public greeting at Booksmith, a bookstore in the Haight-Ashbury neighborhood of San Francisco, a few months before his death. In 1993, Ginsburg visited the University of Maine at Orono to pay homage to the 90-year-old great Carl Rakashi. In 1950, 
Kerouac began studying Buddhism and shared what he learned from Dwight Goddard's Buddhist Bible with Ginsberg. Ginsberg first heard about the Four Noble Truths and such sutras as the Diamond Sutra at this time. Ginsberg's spiritual journey began early on with his spontaneous visions, and continued with an early trip to India with Gary Snyder. Snyder had previously spent time in Kyoto to study at the first Zen Institute at Daitakuji Monastery. At one point, Snyder chanted the Prajnaparamita, which in Ginsberg's words blew my mind. His interest peaked. Ginsberg traveled to meet the Dalai Lama as well as the Karmapa at Rumtek Monastery. Continuing on his journey, Ginsberg met Ujum Rinpoche in Kalampong, who taught him, If you see something horrible, don't cling to it, and if you see something beautiful, don't cling to it. After returning to the United States, a chance encounter on a New York City street with Chugam Trungpa Rinpoche, they both tried to catch the same cab, a Kaku and Nyingma Tibetan Buddhist master, led to Trungpa becoming his friend and lifelong teacher. Ginsberg helped Trungpa and New York poet Anne Waldman in founding the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. Ginsberg was also involved with Krishnaism. He had started incorporating chanting the Hare Krishna mantra into his religious practice in the mid-1960s. After learning that A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of the Hare Krishna movement in the Western world had rented a storefront in New York, he befriended him visiting him often and suggesting publishers for his books, and a fruitful relationship began. This relationship is documented by Satsvarup Dasakaswami in his biographical account Srila Prabhupada Lilamrita. Ginsberg donated money, materials, and his reputation to help the Swami establish the first temple, and toured with him to promote his cause. Despite disagreeing with many of Bhaktivedanta Swami's required prohibitions, Ginsberg often sang the Hare Krishna mantra publicly as part of his philosophy and declared that it brought a state of ecstasy. He was glad that Bhaktivedanta Swami, an authentic Swami from India, was now trying to spread the Shantinj in America. Along with other counterculture ideologists like Timothy Leary, Gary Snyder, and Alan Watts, Ginsberg hoped to incorporate Bhaktivedanta Swami on his chanting into the hippie movement, and agreed to take part in the mantra rock dance concert and to introduce the Swami to the Haight Ashbury hippie community. On January 17, 1967, Ginsberg helped plan and organize a reception for Bhaktivedanta Swami at San Francisco International Airport, where 50 to 100 hippies greeted the Swami, chanting Hare Krishna in the airport lounge with flowers and hands. To further support and promote Bhaktivedanta Swami's message and chanting in San Francisco, Allen Ginsberg agreed to attend the Mantra Rock Dance, a musical event 1967 held at the Avalon Ballroom by the San Francisco Hare Krishna Temple. It featured some leading rock bands of the time, Big Brother and the Holding Company with Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, and Moby Grape, who performed there along with the Hare Krishna founder Bhaktivedanta Swami and donated proceeds to the Krishna Temple. Ginsberg introduced Bhaktivedanta Swami to some 3,000 hippies in the audience and led the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mantra. Music and chanting were both important parts of Ginsberg's live delivery during poetry readings. He often accompanied himself on a harmonium, and was often accompanied by a guitarist. It is believed that the Hindi and Buddhist poet Nagarjuna had introduced Ginsberg to the harmonium in Benares. According to Malay Roy Chowdhury, Ginsberg refined his practice while learning from his relatives, including his cousin Savitri Banerjee. When Ginsberg asked if he could sing a song in praise of Lord Krishna on William F. Buckley Jr.'s TV show Firing Line on September 3, 1968, Buckley acceded and the poet chanted slowly as he played dolefully on a harmonium. According to Richard Brookheiser, an associate of Buckley's, the host commented that it was the most unharried Krishna I've ever heard. At the 1967 Human Bean in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park, the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago, and the 1970 Black Panther rally at Yale campus Allen chanted Om repeatedly over a sound system for hours on end. And Ginsberg further brought mantras into the world of rock and roll when he recited the Heart Sutra in the song Ghetto Defendant. The song appears on the 1982 album Combat Rock by British first wave punk band The Clash. Ginsberg came in touch with the hungrylist poets of Bengal, especially Malay Roy Chowdhury, who introduced Ginsberg to the Three Fishes with one head of Indian Emperor Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. The Three Fishes symbolized coexistence of all thought, philosophy and religion. In spite of Ginsberg's attraction to Eastern religions, the journalist Jane Kramer argues that he, like Whitman, 
adhere to an American brand of mysticism that was rooted in humanism and in a romantic and visionary ideal of harmony among men. In 1960, he was treated for a tropical disease, and it is speculated that he contracted hepatitis from an unsterilized needle administered by a doctor, which played a role in his death 37 years later. Ginsburg was a lifelong smoker, and though he tried to quit for health and religious reasons, his busy schedule in later life made it difficult, and he always returned to smoking. In the 1970s, Ginsburg suffered two minor strokes which were first diagnosed as Bell's palsy, which gave him significant paralysis and stroke-like drooping off the muscles in one side of his face. Later in life, he also suffered constant minor ailments such as high blood pressure. Many of these symptoms were related to stress, but he never slowed down his schedule. Ginsburg won a 1974 National Book Award for, split with Adrienne Rich, diving into the wreck. In 1986, Ginsburg was awarded the Golden Wreath by the Struga Poetry Evenings International Festival in Macedonia, the second American poet to be so awarded since W. H. Auden. At Struga, he met with the other Golden Wreath winners Bulat Okudzava and Andrei Vosensensky. In 1993, the French Minister of Culture made him a Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres. Ginsburg continued to help his friends as much as he could, going so far as to give money to Herbert Hunk out of his own pocket and housing a broke-in drug-addicted Harry Smith. With the exception of a special guest appearance at the NYU Poetry Slam on February 20, 1997, Ginsburg gave what is thought to be his last reading at the Booksmith in San Francisco on December 16, 1996. After returning home from the hospital for the last time, where he had been unsuccessfully treated for congestive heart failure, Ginsburg continued making phone calls to say goodbye to nearly everyone in his address book. Some of the phone calls, including one with Johnny Depp, were sad and interrupted by crying, and others were joyous and optimistic. Ginsburg continued to write through his final illness, with his last poem, Things I'll Not Do, Nostalgias, written on March 30th. He died surrounded by family and friends in his East Village loft in New York City, succumbing to liver cancer via complications of hepatitis. He was 70 years old. Gregory Corso, Roy Lichtenstein, Patty Smith and others came by to pay their respects. One third of Ginsburg's ashes were buried in his family plot in Gomel Chess Cemetery in Newark, New Jersey. He was survived by Orlovsky. When Orlovsky died, as per Ginsburg's wishes, another third of his ashes were buried alongside Orlovsky at Shambhala Mountain Center in Colorado. The remaining third of the ashes are buried at Jewel Heart, Golak Rinpoche's Sangha, in India. In 1998, Various writers, including Catfish McDerris Reed at a gathering at Ginsburg's farm to honor Allen and the Beatniks. Ginsburg's willingness to talk about taboo subjects made him a controversial figure during the conservative 1950s, and a significant figure in the 1960s. In the mid-1950s, no reputable publishing company would even consider publishing Howell. At the time, such sex talk employed in Howell was considered be some to be vulgar or even a form of pornography, and could be prosecuted under law. Ginsburg used phrases such as cocksucker, fucked in the ass, and cunt as part of the poem's depiction of different aspects of American culture. Numerous books that discussed sex were banned at the time, including Lady Chatterley's Lover. The sex that Ginsburg described did not portray the sex between heterosexual married couples, or even longtime lovers. Instead, Ginsburg portrayed casual sex. For example, in Howl, Ginsburg praises the man who sweetened the snatches of a million girls. Ginsburg used gritty descriptions and explicit sexual language, pointing out the man who lounged hungry and lonesome through Houston seeking jazz or sex or soup. In his poetry, Ginsburg also discussed the then-taboo topic of homosexuality. The explicit sexual language that filled Howell eventually led to an important trial on First Amendment issues. Ginsburg's publisher was brought up on charges for publishing pornography, and the outcome led to a judge going on record dismissing charges, because the poem carried redeeming social importance, thus setting an important legal precedent. Ginsburg continued to broach controversial subjects throughout the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s. From 1970 to 1996, Ginsburg had a long term affiliation with Pan American Center with efforts to defend free expression. When explaining how he approached controversial topics, he often pointed to Herbert Hunk. He said Tad when he first got to know Hunk in the 1940s, Ginsburg saw that he was sick from his heroin addiction, but at the time heroin was a taboo subject and Hunk was left with nowhere to go for help.
Ginsburg was a signer of the anti-war manifesto A Call to Resist Illegitimate Authority, circulated among draft resistors in 1967 by members of the radical intellectual collective Resist. Other signers and Resist members included Mitchell Goodman, Henry Braun, Denise Levertov, Noam Chomsky, William Sloan Coffin, Dwight MacDonald, Robert Lowell, and Norman Mailer. In 1968, Ginsburg signed the Writers and Editors War Tax Protest Pledge, vowing to refuse tax payments in protest against the Vietnam War. He was present the night of the Tompkins Square Park riot in 1988 and provided an eyewitness account to the New York Times. Allen Ginsberg called attention to the suffering of victims during the Bangladesh Liberation War in 1971. He wrote his legendary 152-line poem, September on Jaysore Road, after visiting refugee camps and witnessing the plight of millions fleeing the violence. Millions of daughters walk in the mud Millions of children wash in the flood A million girls vomit and groan Millions of families hopeless alone Ginsburg's poem also serves as an indictment of the United States Where are the helicopters of U.S. aid? Smuggling dope in Bangkok's green shade Where is America's Air Force of Light? Bombing North Laos all day and all night? Out of the poem, he made a song that was performed by Bob Dylan, other musicians and Ginsburg himself the last few lines of the poem read Ginsberg talked openly about his connections with communism and his admiration for past communist heroes and the labor movement at a time when the Red Scare and McCarthyism were still raging. He admired Fidel Castro and many other quasi-Marxist figures from the 20th century. In America, 1956, Ginsberg writes, America, I used to be a communist when I was a kid I'm not sorry. Biographer Joan Araskin has claimed that, Despite his often stark opposition to communist orthodoxy, Ginsburg held his own idiosyncratic version of communism. On the other hand, when Donald Manies, a New York City politician, publicly accused Ginsburg of being a member of the Communist Party, Ginsburg objected, I am not, as a matter of fact, a member of the Communist Party, nor am I dedicated to the overthrow of the U.S. government or any government by violence. I must say that I see little difference between the armed and violent governments both communist and capitalist had I have observed. Ginsburg traveled to several communist countries to promote free speech. He claimed that communist countries, such as China, welcomed him, because they thought he was an enemy of capitalism, but often turned against him when they saw him as a troublemaker. For example, in 1965 Ginsburg was deported from Cuba for publicly protesting the persecution of homosexuals and referring to Che Guevara as cute. The Cubans sent him to Czechoslovakia, where one week after being named the Krau Majalisu, King of May, a student's festivity, celebrating spring and student life, Ginsburg was arrested for alleged drug use and public drunkenness, and the security agency STB confiscated several of his writings, which they considered to be lewd and morally dangerous. Ginsburg was then deported from Czechoslovakia on May 7, 1965 by order of the STB. Václav Havel points to Ginsburg as an important inspiration. One contribution that is often considered his most significant and most controversial was his openness about homosexuality. Ginsburg was an early proponent of freedom for gay people. In 1943, he discovered within himself mountains of homosexuality. He expressed this desire openly and graphically in his poetry. He also struck a note for gay marriage by listing Peter Orlovsky, his lifelong companion as his spouse in his Who's Who entry. Subsequent gay writers saw his frank talk about homosexuality as an opening to speak more openly and honestly about something often before only hinted at or spoken of in metaphor. In writing about sexuality in graphic detail and in his frequent use of language seen as indecent, he challenged, and ultimately changed, obscenity laws. He was a staunch supporter of others whose expression challenged obscenity laws, William S. Burroughs and Lenny Bruce, for example. Ginsburg was a supporter and member of the North American man slash boy Love Association, NAMBLA, a pedophilia and pederasty advocacy organization in the United States that works to abolish age of consent laws and legalize sexual relations between adults and children, saying that attacks on NAMBLA think off politics, witch hunting for profit, humorlessness, vanity, anger and ignorance, I'm a member of NAMBLA, because I love boys too, everybody does, who has a little humanity. In Thoughts on NAMBLA a 1994 essay published in the collection Deliberate Prose, Ginsburg stated, NAMBLA is a form for a form of those laws on youthful sexuality which members deem oppressive, a discussion society not a sex club. I joined NAMBLA in defense of free speech. In 1994, Ginsburg appeared in a documentary on NAMBLA called, 
playing on the game ale slang term chicken hawk, in which he read a graphic Odato Youth. Ginsburg talked often about drug use. He organized the New York City chapter of Lamar, legalized marijuana. Throughout the 1960s he took an active role in the demystification of LSD, and, with Timothy Leary, worked to promote its common use. He remained for many decades an advocate of marijuana legalization, and, at the same time, warned his audiences against the hazards of tobacco in his Put Down Your Cigarette Rag, Don't Smoke, Don't Smoke, Don't Smoke, Nicotine, Nicotine, No, No, Don't Smoke, The Official Dope, Smoke, Dope, Dope. On the latter's book The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, which claimed that the CIA was knowingly involved in the production of heroin in the Golden Triangle of Burma, Thailand, and Laos. In addition to working with McCoy, Ginsburg personally confronted Richard Helms, the director of the CIA in the 1970s, about the matter, but Helms denied that the CIA had anything to do with selling illegal drugs. Allen wrote many essays and articles, researching and compiling evidence of the CIA's alleged involvement in drug trafficking, but it would take 10 years, and the publication of McCoy's book in 1972, before anyone took him seriously. In 1978 Ginsburg received a note from the chief editor of the New York Times, apologizing for not taking his allegations seriously so many years previous. The political subject is dealt with in his song-slash-poem CIA Dope Calypso. The United States Department of State responded to McCoy's initial allegations stating that they were unable to find any evidence to substantiate them, much less proof. Subsequent investigations by the Inspector General of the CIA, United States House Committee on Foreign Affairs, and United States Senate Select Committee to Study Governmental Operations with Respect to Intelligence Activities, aka the Church Committee, also found the charges to be unsubstantiated. Most of Ginsburg's very early poetry was written in formal rhyme and meter like that of his father, and of his idol William Blake. His admiration for the writing of Jack Kerouac inspired him to take poetry more seriously. In 1955, upon the advice of a psychiatrist, Ginsburg dropped out of the working world to devote his entire life to poetry. Soon after, he wrote Howl, the poem that brought him and his beat generation contemporaries to national attention and allowed him to live as a professional poet for the rest of his life. Later in life, Ginsburg entered academia, teaching poetry as distinguished professor of English at Brooklyn College from 1986 until his death. Ginsburg claimed throughout his life that his biggest inspiration was Kerouac's concept of spontaneous prose. He believed literature should come from the soul without conscious restrictions. Ginsburg was much more prone to revise than Kerouac. For example, when Kerouac saw the first draft of how he disliked the fact that Ginsburg had made editorial changes in pencil, transposing Negro and Angry in the first line, for example. Kerouac only wrote out his concepts of spontaneous prose at Ginsburg's insistence because Ginsburg wanted to learn how to apply the technique to his poetry. The inspiration for Howe was Ginsburg's friend, Carl Solomon, and Howe is dedicated to him. Solomon was a Dada and Surrealism enthusiast, he introduced Ginsburg to Artaud, who suffered bouts of clinical depression. Solomon wanted to commit suicide but he thought a form of suicide appropriate to Dadaism would be to go to a mental institution and demand a lobotomy. The institution refused, giving him many forms of therapy, including electroshock therapy. Much of the final section of the first part of Howl is a description of this. Ginsburg used Solomon as an example of all those ground down by the machine of Moloch. Moloch, to whom the second section is addressed, is a Levantine god to whom children were sacrificed. Ginsburg may have gotten the name from the Kenneth Rexroth poem Thou Shalt Not Kill, a poem about the death of one of Ginsburg's heroes, Dylan Thomas. Moloch is mentioned a few times in the Torah and references to Ginsburg's Jewish background are frequent in his work. Ginsburg said the image of Moloch was inspired by peyote visions he had of the Francis Drake Hotel in San Francisco which appeared to him as a skull, he took it as a symbol of the city, not specifically San Francisco, but all cities. Ginsburg later acknowledged in various publications and interviews that behind the visions of the Francis Drake Hotel were memories of the Moloch of Fritz Lang's film Metropolis, 1927, and of the woodcut novels of Lindward. Moloch has subsequently been interpreted as any system of control, including the conformist society of post-World War II America, focused on material gain, which Ginsburg frequently blamed for the destruction of all those outside of societal norms. He also made sure to emphasize that Moloch is a part of humanity in multiple aspects, in that the decision to defy socially created systems of control, and therefore go against Moloch, is a form of self-destruction.
Many of the characters Ginsberg references in Howl, such as Neil Cassidy and Herbert Hunk, destroyed themselves through excessive substance abuse or a generally wild lifestyle. The personal aspects of Howl are perhaps as important as the political aspects. Carl Solomon, the prime example of a best mind destroyed by defying society, is associated with Ginsberg's schizophrenic mother. The line with mother finally fuck comes after a long section about Carl Solomon, and in part 3, Ginsberg says, I'm with you in Rockland where you imitate the shade of my mother. Ginsberg later admitted that the drive to write Howl was fueled by sympathy for his ailing mother, an issue which he was not yet ready to deal with directly. He dealt with it directly with 1959's Kaddish, which had its first public reading at a Catholic Worker Friday night meeting, possibly due to its associations with Thomas Merton. Ginsberg's poetry was strongly influenced by modernism, most importantly the American style of modernism pioneered by William Carlos Williams, Romanticism, specifically William Blake and John Keats, the beat and cadence of jazz, specifically that of Bach musicians such as Charlie Parker, and his cocky Buddhist practice and Jewish background. He considered himself to have inherited the visionary poetic mantle handed down from the English poet and artist William Blake the American poet Walt Whitman and the Spanish poet Federico García Lorca. The power of Ginsberg's verse, its searching, probing focus, its long and lilting lines, as well as its new world exuberance, all echo the continuity of inspiration that he claimed. He corresponded with William Carlos Williams, who was then in the middle of writing his epic poem Patterson about the industrial city near his home. After attending a reading by Williams, Ginsberg sent the older poet several of his poems and wrote an introductory letter. Most of these early poems were rhymed and metered and included archaic pronouns like the. Williams disliked the poems and told Ginsberg, In this mode, perfection is basic, and these poems are not perfect. Though he disliked these early poems, Williams loved the exuberance in Ginsberg's letter. He included the letter in a later part of Patterson. He encouraged Ginsberg not to emulate the old masters, but to speak with his own voice and the voice of the common American. From Williams, Ginsberg learned to focus on strong visual images, in line with Williams' own motto No Ideas But in Things. Studying Williams' style led to a tremendous shift from the early formalist work to a loose. Colloquial free verse style. Early breakthrough poems include Bricklayer's Lunch Hour and Dream Record. Carl Solomon introduced Ginsberg to the work of Antonin Artaud, to have done with the judgment of God and Van Gogh, the man suicided by society, and Jean Genet, Our Lady of the Flowers. Philip La Mancha introduced him to other surrealists, and surrealism continued to be an influence. For example, sections of Kaddish were inspired by Andre Breton's Free Union. Ginsberg claimed that the anaphoric repetition of Howl and other poems was inspired by Christopher Smart in such poems as Jubilate Ogno. Ginsberg also claimed other more traditional influences, such as, Franz Kafka, Herman Melville, Fyodor Dostoevsky, Edgar Allan Poe, and Emily Dickinson. Ginsberg also made an intense study of haiku in the paintings of Paul Cezanne, from which he adapted a concept important to his work, which he called the eyeball kick. He noticed in viewing Cezanne's paintings that when the eye moved from one color to a contrasting color, the eye would spasm, or kick. Likewise, he discovered that the contrast of two seeming opposites was a common feature in haiku. Ginsberg used this technique in his poetry, putting together two starkly dissimilar images, something weak with something strong, an artifact of high culture with an artifact of low culture, something holy with something unholy. The example Ginsberg most often used was Hydrogen Jukebox which later became the title of a song cycle composed by Philip Glass with lyrics drawn from Ginsberg's poems. Another example is Ginsberg's observation on Bob Dylan during Dylan's hectic and intense 1966 electric guitar tour, fueled by a cocktail of amphetamines, opiates, alcohol, and psychedelics, as a dexedrine clown. The phrases eyeball kick and hydrogen jukebox both show up in Howl, as well as a direct quote from Cezanne, Pater Omnipotens Eterna Deus. Allen Ginsberg also found inspiration in music. He frequently included music in his poetry, invariably composing his tunes on an old Indian harmonium, which he often played during his readings. He wrote and recorded music to accompany William Blake's songs of innocence and songs of experience. He also recorded a handful of other albums. To create music for Howl and Wichita Vortex Sutra he worked with the minimalist composer, Philip Glass. Ginsberg worked with drew inspiration from, and inspired artists such as Bob Dylan, The Clash, Patti Smith, Phil Oaks, 
and a thugs. He worked with Dylan on various projects and maintained a friendship with him over many years. In 1996, he also recorded a song co-written with Paul McCartney and Philip Glass, The Ballad of the Skeletons, which reached number 8 on the Triple J Hottest 100 for that year. From the study of his idols and mentors and the inspiration of his friends, not to mention his own experiments, Ginsberg developed an individualistic style of thoughts easily identified as Ginsbergian. Ginsberg stated that Whitman's long line was a dynamic technique few other poets had ventured to develop further, and Whitman is also often compared to Ginsberg because their poetry sexualized aspects of the male form. Many of Ginsberg's early long line experiments contain some sort of anaphora, repetition of a fixed bass, for example who and how, America in America, and this has become a recognizable feature of Ginsberg's style. He said later this was a crutch because he lacked confidence, he did not yet trust free flight. In the 1960s, after employing it in some sections of Kaddish, Ka for example, he, for the most part, abandoned the anaphoric form. Several of his earlier experiments with methods for formatting poems as a whole became regular aspects of his style in later poems. In the original draft of Howell, each line is in a step triadic format reminiscent of William Carlos Williams. However, he abandoned the step triadic when he developed his long line although the step lines showed up later, most significantly in the travelogues of the fall of America. Howell and Kaddish, arguably his two most important poems, are both organized as an inverted pyramid, with larger sections leading to smaller sections. In America, he also experimented with a mix of longer and shorter lines. In Howland and his other poetry, Ginsberg drew inspiration from the epic, free verse style of the 19th century American poet Walt Whitman. Both wrote passionately about the promise, and betrayal, of American democracy, the central importance of erotic experience, and the spiritual quest for the truth of everyday existence. J. D. McClatchy, editor of the Yale Review, called Ginsberg the best-known American poet of his generation, as much a social force as a literary phenomenon. McClatchy added that Ginsberg, like Whitman, was a bard in the old manner, outsized, darkly prophetic, part exuberance, part prayer, part rant. His work is finally a history of our era's psyche, with all its contradictory urges. McClatchy's barbed eulogies define the essential difference between Ginsberg, a beat poet whose writing was, journalism raised by combining the recycling genius with a generous mimic empathy, to strike audience accessible chords, always lyrical and sometimes truly poetic, and Kerouac, a poet of singular brilliance, the brightest luminary of a beat generation he came to symbolize in popular culture, though, in reality he far surpassed his contemporaries, Kerouac is an originating genius, exploring then answering, like Rambo a century earlier, by necessity more than by choice, the demands of authentic self-expression as applied to the evolving quicksilver mind of America's only literary virtuoso. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.